Good morning, church. It's good to be with you once again in your living rooms or wherever you're, you're watching this feed. I'm going to just dive right on in this morning. I trust that you've already developed some sort of schedule and you're sitting there anxiously awaiting the word of the Lord and you have your Bibles out. So since you do already, I'm going to have you turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. As you remember last week, we left Elijah with the widow woman and her son, and all three of them were being cared for by the provision of God's hand. So let's pick up in, in uh, verse 17 of chapter 17. It says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the body three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You know, of all the episodes in the life of Elijah, this is probably the most troublesome for, for any number of reasons and for many of us today. There's really not another story like it in the Old Testament. So in our text it says, Elijah lays himself over the body of this dead child and the boy comes back to life. It's not really like the story of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday morning and it doesn't carry with it the same feel of Jesus crying out, Lazarus, come forth, in John chapter 11. Indeed, this is an unusual story, and because it is an unusual story, some people have discounted this story as being a myth or um, a folk story or maybe a fairy tale. Even some critical scholars suggest that either the boy wasn't really dead or that this never really happened at all. And before we go further, I would tell you that I believe this story. I firmly believe exactly what the Bible says. I believe the widow's son did die. I believe that Elijah did stretch himself over the boy's body and pray. I believe God heard his prayer and the boy's life returned to him. Now, having said that, I would also acknowledge to you the emotional difficulties. Emotional difficulties because it raises questions we don't often talk about. You see, this is one of those stories in the Bible where it'd be easy to pass over and just move on to the next part of Elijah's life. It raises questions, questions that every pastor is asked at some point in his ministry. The question is this, if God can do this some of the time, why doesn't he do this all of the time? You know, this is a great question. I don't know how we can really wrap our minds around or come to grips with some of the great mysteries of God in His mercy and His sovereignty. What God does and what God doesn't do. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but let's look at how the story begins. The, the story begins with unfathomable sorrow. Sadly, it's not unfathomable for some because some have experienced this sorrow. It is unfathomable for me because I've never experienced anything like this personally. The story says sometime later the son of the woman who owned the house became ill and he grew worse and worse. Finally he stops breathing. The widow woman says to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Verses 17 and 18. I want you to notice very carefully the first phrase, sometime later. You see, in the Hebrew, it literally says, 
after these things, it happened. This is an amazing, this is a powerful statement about God's sovereignty. Whatever you want to say about this story, don't call it an accident. This child did not die by chance. His sickness and his death were both part of the sovereign plan of God. There are many mysteries about what, why God does what he does or why he doesn't do what he doesn't do. I'm reminded of the words of Tony Evans who said, everything in the universe is either caused by God or allowed by God. There's no third category. Again, this is a hugely important statement. Many times we look at a heartbreaking tragedy such as the death of a child and we want to invent a third category. Things just happen for no reason. But there's no such category. So when the text says to us that it came about that the child grew ill, the writer here is saying to us that what happened to this young boy is not an accident. It wasn't by chance. It's not fate. God was present in this home when that boy died. However, the timing certainly deserves our attention. Now I say that because remember, this boy gets sick after many months of miraculous provision by the hand of God. You remember the bear of oil, the jar of flour. So after many months of the flour and oil never running out, suddenly now the boy gets sick and he dies. Again, we ask the question, why does this happen this way? Why does this happen to people when we walk with the Lord and we're doing the best we can? And then one day we get that phone call that changes our lives forever. We get the report from a doctor of the bad news. Our children get into trouble. Our marriage, after many years, suddenly falls apart. Why do these things happen? Now, I've learned over the years that at times it can become, or we can become very complacent in the midst of the blessings of God. We secretly or we subconsciously begin to think, you know, everything's good. Everything's good now. My marriage is good, my kids are good, we're all healthy, my job is good and is secure. Life is good. I'm exactly where I wanted to be, I'm exactly where I need to be right now at this point in my life. And if that happens to be your situation this morning, certainly don't feel bad about that. If your life is, life is like that, you certainly ought to enjoy it and you ought to be profoundly grateful to the Lord God. But know this, it won't last forever. It never does. Soon the clouds will move in and it'll begin to rain. Now I'm not suggesting that we live in fear. We, we know better than that. We were not born with a spirit of timidity. But soon enough the clouds will move in again and it'll rain. We know for every sunrise, there's a sunset. So it is for each and every one of us. So after a time of blessing, disaster strikes. We don't know why the child got sick. And it almost seems like a contradiction here. There's testing and blessing and then this sorrow comes. And it seems to me that it really should be reversed somehow. It ought to be sorrow, testing, then blessing. But this is not how God works. It's more often this way. Testing, blessing, and sorrow. It would be easy for us to be lulled into false thinking. You know, we're good. We've made it through the hard times. Everything from here on out will be smooth sailing. But again, that's not usually God's design for us. I've been in the ministry for a long time. And of all the sorrows of life, I know no sorrow greater than the death of a child. It just seems unnatural. Parents are not supposed to bury their children. It's actually the privilege and the honor of children to bury their parents. It's not supposed to be the other way around. It doesn't make sense to me. So the death of a child is like a period before the end of a sentence. Many years ago, I was called to the hospital because a child had died in utero. As I drove to the hospital, it occurred to me that when I was new in the ministry, I used to dread those moments. 
It's only in the later years that I've come to understand that this is what ministry is all about. Preaching and teaching is really the most visible part of the ministry, but that's not the whole thing. The real work is done in the hospitals or funeral homes, comforting broken-hearted parents and family members. In the beginning of my ministry, I was afraid that I would say the wrong thing. Over the years, I've learned the less you say, the better. So when I got to the hospital this particular day, I was ushered into a small room where the parents were holding this little baby in their arms, and it was obvious they had been weeping. And again, it occurred to me, this is one of the greatest honors of being a pastor, and that is to bring the Lord into a situation just like this. When I looked at the tiny baby, of the, the tiny body of this little baby, the parents and I spoke for a few moments, and then the mother began to weep again. She was rocking the child back and forth. She said to me, God has a plan for this, doesn't he? And I took a deep breath and told her, yes, God does have a reason, but I don't know what it is. Again, in the early days of ministry, I would have tried to give her a long explanation, which would have done no good. Over the years, I've learned, you know, if you don't know, it's just best to say that you don't know. I don't know why her child died any more than I know why the widow's child died in this story. This mother's dashed, dreams were dashed, and certainly she didn't see it coming. And if we go back into the text, the widow thought that her and her son would have died together because of the famine in the land. But now in her anguish and in her sorrow, she blames Elijah. She asks the question, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and then kill my son? Now I thought about that and there, there are at least three possible explanations for her line of thinking. So perhaps she thought that having a prophet in the house made her immune from suffering. And who can blame her when you stop to think about it? And particularly after all the miraculous provision of the flour and the oil. Maybe she assumed that her own sin somehow caused her son's death, but when you read through the narrative, that doesn't appear to be the case. Or she blamed Elijah because this is a very human thing to do, to blame somebody else when tragedy strikes, which takes us to the faith of Elijah, Elijah's faith in action. So as I read through the text, a few questions came to mind that I really can't pinpoint. I can't give an answer to it. When the child first became ill, where was Elijah? Was he there and did he pray for this boy? Now I'm going to make an assumption here and say he probably did, but the Bible doesn't really say that. One more question. When the child died, why did Elijah do what he did? I believe he gets involved because he saw God in everything including the sorrows of life. I find this very instructive that when a mother accuses him of coming to her house to kill her son, Elijah doesn't get angry. He doesn't try to explain to her why her son died. He doesn't argue with her. And he doesn't make any excuses. Instead, he responds with incredible gentleness. Regarding this response from Elijah, F.B. E. Meyer commented this way, We need more of this practical goodness. Well, that's a good word for us. He went on to say, Many people deceive themselves. They go to fervent meetings and profess that they've placed everything they have, everything they are, on the altar. They speak as if they are indeed filled with the Holy Spirit. But when they return to their homes, the least friction or interference with their plans or a mistake on the part of others or some angry outburst arises a sudden and violent manifestation of their temper. Such people, he says, have not yet experienced this special grace. There's much more for them to learn, he says. He who first led them to Jesus is able to make them meek with his meekness and gentle with his gentleness. He went on to say, if the Holy Spirit is really filling the heart, there will come over the rudest, the least refined, 
the most selfish person a marvelous change. There will be a gentleness in speech, a softness of voice, a tender thoughtfulness in the very smallest actions, an expression of abiding peace on their face. These, he went on to say, and hear this, these shall be the evident seal of the Holy Spirit. He calls it the mint mark of heaven. I love that, the mint mark of heaven. So when the widow makes his unkind accusation, Elijah responds very simply, Give me your son, he says to her in verse 19a. Listen, when I visit with a family where a death has occurred, I certainly don't say as much as I used to in my earlier years. In the beginning, I would probably do too much talking. Looking back, I, again, probably felt nervous or awkward and had a, a, a need about me or I felt like I need to explain things. I don't say that much anymore. For one thing, I find that people in sorrow don't really remember much of what you say anyway, and there's always the danger of saying too much. But the Bible says, he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with? By causing her son to die. Now listen very carefully. The Bible says that he stretched himself, himself out on the boy. Three times and he cries to the Lord. O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. Now there's not really an easy way for me to explain what happens next. So the Bible says he stretches himself out on the boy. It doesn't say he stretched himself across the boy, like this. He stretches himself out over this boy. He lays down on top of the body of this boy, foot to foot, leg to leg, chest to chest, arm to arm, hand to hand, and face to face. He not only does it once, twice, he does it three times. Perhaps Elijah understands that to do anything with this boy, he's going to have to get very personal. But also understand this as a side, since this boy is now dead, he's now unclean under Jewish law, which means it is wrong for a prophet of God to touch a dead body. But extreme cases call for extreme measures. So by lying down on the body of this child, it's as if Elijah is saying to the Lord, Lord God, take some of the life from within me and give it to this boy. Elijah prays for a miracle because he believes in a power that is greater than death. A.W. Pink points out some noteworthy features, features of this prayer of Elijah. This is a good word for us as well. He points out that Elijah went to his private room where he could be alone with God. And that he prayed fervently. That he relied on his personal experience in calling him my God. He also recalls God's sovereignty in causing this child to die. Again, he prays earnestly and persistently. He appeals to God's tender mercy toward this widow. He makes a very definite request. Let this boy's life return to him. So you have to ask yourself, where did he learn to pray like that? Where is the precedent in the Bible prior to Elijah for anybody to pray in that way? Understand, before this moment, before Elijah, no one had ever brought back, been brought back from the dead. No one. Enoch walked with God, but he was taken directly to heaven without God. The Bible says that Moses died and they never found his burial site, but that doesn't mean that he was raised from the dead. So this is the very first case in biblical history of anyone who died and came back to life. So where does he get faith to pray like this? Again, it's not as he could look back in history and say, God, do what you did in the days of Moses, because God didn't do that in the day of Moses. 
He couldn't say, God, do what you did for my father Abraham. Because God didn't do that in the days of Abraham. Abel was not resurrected from the dead after he's murdered by his own brother. And you can only imagine the heartbreak that Eve experienced. Resurrecting someone from the dead, nothing has happened like this before. When Elijah prays, he submits himself completely to God. And understand, in and of himself, Elijah has no power to bring this child back to life. And I found it very interesting. He doesn't demand anything from God, nor does he name it and claim it. He very humbly asks God to let this boy's life return to him. That's as much as he can do. And the rest is up to God. And now we see God's response to Elijah's prayer in verse 22. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. And again, words in the scriptures are, are very meaningful. And I love that. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. I love that. I love it because I want you to notice that the text does not say that the Lord heard Elijah's prayer, though indeed he is praying. It says he heard Elijah's cry. I want you to think about that. And while you think about it, let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered what the Bible means when it talks about how the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered in the book of Romans chapter 8? Many years ago, I heard a Bible teacher tell of a, a car wreck in which his wife was badly hurt. When he got to the accident scene, she was unconscious and her life was hanging in the balance. Listen to his testimony. As he rode in the ambulance his body with her, he stretches his body, his arms, over this woman's body. He says, and I quote, In that moment, all I could do was say, Oh God, oh Jesus, oh God, oh Jesus, oh God, oh Jesus. And then he added these words. I felt like it was the first time in my life that I had ever really prayed. When you hear those words, where does your mind take you? Maybe it takes you back to an unseen complication involving the birth of one of your children. Or maybe an automobile accident involving a family member or a close friend or an overdose or a stroke or a heart attack. Maybe your mind races you back to the emergency room that's exploding with activity. Nurses and doctors running in and out, carts being wheeled in and out. And you sit in the waiting room, waiting to speak to the attending fish, physician who's operating on your child, your spouse, your family member, or close friend. And while you're sitting there, you realize things happen so fast that you didn't have a chance to kiss them goodbye. Or you didn't have a chance to pray with them. You didn't have a chance to do anything. So as you sit in the waiting room and you try to pray, no words come out of your mouth. All you can say is, oh God, have mercy. Oh Jesus, have mercy. Oh God, have mercy. Maybe you've said the same words. And I felt like that day was the first time I had ever prayed in my life. I think many of us have been there. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Elijah is a man with a nature just like ours. He is a man just like us. He had the same fears and the same doubts, the same worries and the same concerns as you and I do. In the previous verse, in the New King James Version, it says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want you to write somewhere in, in your margin on your Bible near this. The word fervent here comes from a Greek word that means boiling. So we could state this a different way. The boiling prayers of the righteous avail much with God. So what's a boiling prayer? 
I'll tell you what it has nothing to do with. It has nothing to do with standing or sitting, kneeling or lying down. It has nothing to do with you lifting your voice or speaking in a very low whisper. It has nothing to do with how loud or how long you pray. You get the gist of what I'm saying. I don't think I need to define all of it. But listen to me. When you take your spouse or your son or your daughter for surgery, you will discover at that point what a bowling prayer really is. When your children are in, in trouble, you will pray boiling prayers. It's what happens when you pray like nothing else in the world matters. So when the Bible says here, the Lord heard Elijah's cry, it means that he stretched himself out on that boy's dead body and something miraculous happened. God spoke from heaven and said, all right, man of God, it shall be done. Effective, boiling prayers of the righteous avails much. The boy's life returns to him and he lives. The boy who was dead has now come back to life. Certainly this is a miracle of God. And then we see the mother's testimony. So we come to the end of the story and now seeing that her son has come back to life, this grateful mother declares to Elijah, now I know. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth in verse 24. And again, the Bible doesn't say or it doesn't record this. She said, thank you. I'll just stretch here and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that she did multiple times. It's not recorded here because it's not the point. Now listen to me very carefully. Her words explain this miracle. And her words also explain why not every mother receives this miracle when a child is sick to the point of death. This miracle happens to authenticate Elijah as God's anointed prophet. God, if you remember, had promised to sustain all three of them, mother, son, and Elijah, until the rains came and the drought ended back in verse 14. It's on that promise that Elijah believed that God would bring the boy back to life. As strange as this may sound, this miracle is less about the boy and it's more about God's power working through his prophet, Elijah. It certainly is a miracle of sovereign grace, given this one time in Elijah's life, and never again in his ministry. So God answers his prayer by this man in this way, at this particular moment in time, and he does it for his own purposes. And remember the words of the psalmist, our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. Psalm 11, or Psalm 115 verse 3. So there's really no other way to understand this story. This is really a story, this is a lesson about the sovereign of the universe moving in a miraculous way to answer, in answer to this prophet's fervent prayers. Now I know, the widow says. Now I know. Just think about that for a moment. This is really a message from God for the church of Jesus Christ globally. The world waits to see the power of God. The world doesn't need another formula from us and it certainly doesn't need any more empty promises. The world needs what this woman needed, a demonstration of God's power. If you remember when John the Baptist was in prison, he was discouraged and beseeched with doubt, he sends out messages, messengers to Jesus with this question, are you the one who, who was to come, or should we expect someone else? That's a good question. It's the right question. So the world looks at us and says, now you talk a lot about Jesus, but how do we know he's the one we're looking for? Now, getting back to John, I want you to remember that John had already called Jesus 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But now he's asking this question, are you the one or should we look for someone else? I love the, the response from Jesus here. He doesn't rebuke John. And he doesn't quote Old Testament prophecy, which certainly he could have done. But instead he instructs the messengers to go back and tell John what they have seen and heard. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4 and 6. Let the power of God be seen, and all the world will pay attention to the message. Unbelievers ignore us because we have given them formulas when we need to demonstrate the power of the living God. Now I know, she says to Elijah. Now I know. I want you to compare that with, the, with verse 18 where she speaks very bitterly to Elijah. Notice how her bitterness turns to faith as she's come to understand that God only wounds in order to heal. When this child is raised to life, she's now encouraged and the prophet is now affirmed. So in our journey through Elijah's life, we've come to the end of this period of his personal preparation. He's graduated from basic training. Little does Elijah know that he'll soon confront the prophets of Baal in the greatest public showdown of his life. But before we're going, I want us to look at Elijah's preparation from his perspective. I want us to think of it this way. He lives in the ravine, the Karif ravine, and he's attending Hard Knocks University. Then he's moved to Empty Barrow Graduate School. He's now just finished an internship at Resurrection Hospital. All of these things are part of his training to make him ready for the work that God is for him to do. So what does he learn in these experiences? At the brook, he learned that God can take care of me. From the empty barrel, he learned God can use me to help others. From the child that died, he learned God can work through me to do the impossible. So it's not by chance that in verse 1 of 1 Kings 17, he's called Elijah the Tishbite. But in verse 24, the woman now calls him man of God. His preparation is finished. It's graduation day. He's now ready for the ultimate challenge. Listen to me when I tell you, no one, no one, no one becomes a man of God by chance, and no one becomes a man of God overnight. God must bring us to the end of ourselves so that we will learn, and this is important, that it is all about Him, and it is not about us. When that truth breaks through, then we also will be ready to be used by God in a mighty way. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this story which speaks through the centuries on so many levels to us today. Lord, we thank you for its encouragement. We confess that all of us have questions that we cannot answer. Lord, you do things we don't understand and you put us in places that seem to have no purpose. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of providential purpose. We thank you for the gift of prayer. So, Father, we're going to use that gift this morning and ask you to give us Elijah-like faith and to forgive us for holding back and doubting instead of trusting you for the impossible. Lord, teach each of us to pray effective, fervent, boiling prayers so that the world may look at us and say, now we know the living God is in this place. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Until next week, again, please take good care of yourself. Come on back home. It's, it's good. Until then, take good care of yourselves.
Take good care of your family and your neighbors. Reach out where you can, when you can, so that the world will know that God is in this place. See you next week.